On today's show, we deep dive into golf cart jetpacks, robot cowboys, and of course, an art installation that I would like to live in forever. Then Ted Sholowitz from Barco Escape stops by to tell us how they are revolutionizing the film going experience, starting with Star Trek Beyond. We're also checking out a really interesting crowdfund that will allow you, using virtual reality, to listen to an orchestra in outer space. It's going to be a good episode. It's tomorrow daily. <laughs> Greetings, citizens of the internet. Welcome to Tomorrow Daily, the best geek talk show in the known universe. I'm Ashley Skeba. And I'm Jeff Kanata. We're going to deep dive today. Got some really great topics. We got our ear plugs and nose plugs. We got our swim <laughs> caps. Diving deep. Get out your swim caps, get on the diving board, and let's hit the headlines. <laughs> All right, first up, we have to talk about Crystal Universe. This is part of the art exhibit we talked about earlier this week. Part of DMM.planets. I was sick on Monday and I really want to discuss this with you. Isn't this thing gorgeous? It's amazing that walking <sighs> through this sort of lit wonderland that, I mean, there's several different exhibits. Yeah. The, the one. There's uh, so many. Yeah. And they're all this kind of marriage of art and technology, the, mm -hmm. this uh, technological, almost fantasy world that you get to step through. Uh, lit up, illuminated worlds. And you can interact with them with your cell phone. Yeah, I love this. They have this smartphone feature where you can download the app for the exhibit and then it has a whole bunch of different types of things like a nebula or, you know, different things that happen in outer space. And you can actually hold it, press it, and throw it to the exhibit as you're in it and then it like, will do that thing. Like Pokemons. Just stop that. Just like Pokemons. You stop that. Uh, Everybody's yeah. obsessed with Pokemon. the uh, the Except the me. koi pond one where you're kind of walking along this uh, illuminated it's virtual sort of a, koi pond. Like a high, they sort of I guess they put uh, sm like uh, fog on the ground, right? And then they have project a sort of abstract koi pond yeah. at about calf level, and you can interact with it as you walk through it. I love this soft black hole. Have you seen this? That's, do this you is, are you allowed to actually lay down like that? Yeah, that's the whole point. So you go in there. Because <laughs> I want to like, do that. So the whole space, they're saying your body influences other people's bodies. So you lay down, and as you do that, obviously the air inside this soft black <laughs> hole adjusts how other people are laying. It's like the world's largest waterbed. It looks like that a little <laughs> bit. Like, it really does. Amazing. I, I, this is so cool. I wish we could visit. Uh, it I, is it's, all the way it's over It's until Japan. the end of August yeah. in Japan. So if you have a plane to get booked for Japan or if you live near Japan and you can get there cheaply, you can go to Tokyo, uh, go see this yeah. and then brag to us about how great it was and how we totally missed out because I have to save up for... Tokyo 2020. I got to save up for the Olympics because there's <laughs> going to be a robot village. Oh, man. There's a lot of stuff. But Bedjam agrees with us. We had some user feedback. Bedjam wrote in and said the interactive art is something I wish someone would do in my arena. It seems amazing. Mm. His area. Yeah. Um, he uh, and, and I agree with you, Bedjam. I agree. Like, why do we not have more of these happening in the States? Here in LA, we have the Broad. Yeah. And we have the uh, the infinite room. I just went to the, room. the water room, in, the at, room uh, the at the rain LACMA. room at LACMA, which was really cool. They have a, um, you walk into this, it, you only get 15 minutes in there, and the tickets are crazy to get. You They're have, sold out for months. Yeah, you walk into this big black space with like, I don't know, 10 people total, and there's just a shower of water coming down the center, and there's sensors in the ceiling. And so when you walk toward the water, which is just a sheet of water coming down, it senses that you're close, and it creates a little pocket for your body to stand in. So you can walk through this volume of water and not get wet. I mean, you get a little bit wet, but mostly not wet. But it's wet. as if you are walking in rain without being rained on. Exactly. This rain envelops you but not in the space you're in because it has these sensors. It's pretty cool. And it's just another example. I mean, last week we went and visited the hamster drawing hamster machine. And I we love that, did. that art, artistry and technology are, are inventing these new ways to perceive our world. And, sure. and, you know, it is, technology is beautiful. I think that's one of the themes of this show is how beautiful technology is. And this is just another example of that. Yeah, and I think this is also one of those situations where it, it never, sometimes technology, like for me, and it never needs to really have a purpose sometimes. Like it can just be beautiful. It can just yeah. make something beautiful. And this to me is such a reflection of that and how um, technology can be used to create something we have never seen before or never experienced before, yeah. but is truly art. And, and a lot of people I think 
maybe think of technology as a sort of cold, unfeeling thing. But right. when you see the things like Team Lab are making with technology, I mean, it's that is obvious. That is the obvious rebuttal to that argument. It's like, how can it be cold and unfeeling when when you feel so much just watching a video of this? Yeah, it's really incredible. Really, really cool. It's really stuff. great. I want to um, go to there. I know we want to go to there. Yeah. If anybody has a free uh, pair of plane tickets to Japan and to that exhibit call us. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about your favorite story this week, Swagbot. It's a cowboy robot like I want I've always wanted. Oh, this story just I think it's the Howdy, best. Howdy, partner. How, <laughs> I wonder if you could teach it how to lasso. I bet uh, you could. Oh, that would be rad. So Swagbot is really interesting. So it, it appears, as far as my research goes, it appears that Australia, the, the government of Australia is really making an effort to find ways to incorporate robotics into, um, into farming and professions that would normally be traditionally very sort of analog, yeah. not digital, not incorporated into technology at all. Uh, this is really cool because a lot of places in Australia, <clears throat> excuse me, are extremely remote. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these livestock herds just sort of roam uh, without any supervision until they need to be either checked in on or, yeah. you know, sheared or whatever. If you have sheep, you're going to make sweaters. Um, so now Swagbot, they are uh, right now, it's just sort of keeping an eye on things. <laughs> but then... It's going to at some point they're gonna in they're gonna embed a bunch of different sensors, four different kinds of sensors, to be able to tell if any of these animals are sick or injured yeah. based on their body temperature, um, if the color of them is any different, uh, if it, I mean, a lot of different stuff. So they're gonna be able to monitor these like livestock, which is so cool and it's something I would have never thought of. Putting a lot of sheepdog out of business though. For sure. The, the sheep Those dog Australian lobby. sheepdogs. The sheepdog are, union's gonna be very upset. They're protesting. But and, no, I, and now Swagbot is a scab. They might as well call it Scabbot. It's crossing <laughs> those picket lines, those dog picket lines. I think it's an example though of how robots and, and real sort of AI technology is going to seep into things that are much more nuanced. You know, for many years, robots have been on an assembly line doing a very right. mundane thing. And we're into this point now where with, uh, you know, learned robot intelligence, where applications for robots and artificial intelligence and technology are going to be able to do things that people would have to do and people would have to do because of their judgment, right? It's, this right. is a thing that's going to allow... To have to... It, like decide and say this animal is sick. Yeah, like, those types of decisions have not traditionally been made by robots. Right, and and to think that this thing could be out in a remote place learning, it's pretty cool. It is really cool, and I also like uh, what you said about you know, traditionally we've had robots in factories manufacturing. Right. So you have these you know robots on an assembly line, and they're very stationary. They don't go anywhere. They don't do anything. They're just sort of there. Yeah. And now we're starting to see this sort of dawn of roaming robots and yeah. they're out and about like helper robots you see them in japan like pepper yeah. pepper walks around pepper talks to you pepper interacts with you pepper is designed to keep elderly people in japan from being lonely not just hey your health but right. also companionship and, and different things like that so maybe the sheep will come to love swagbot as a friend oh the the animated gifs that we will get uh i i I'm, it's it's counterintuitive almost because when you imagine the future, you think of this like Blade Runner esque urban sprawl, crazy dystopia. But that's to, not most of the world. Yeah, and to think that you can have that level of technology in a rural environment is pretty interesting. It's you know, pretty it's, awesome. Uh, not something that would jump to my mind first. Yeah, it almost makes me want to do like to write a script or something about not not Firefly like, but very much yeah. like where you see a lot of technology in an extremely rural area as yeah. if it is a completely normal thing. I love that sort of future. It's really fun to think about. Um, okay, so last story and then we will take a break and welcome Ted Shilowitz to our stage. Um, we'll go back in time in our time machine because we <laughs> pre-recorded that, that interview. But um, we have to discuss this uh, golf cart jetpack because... Yeah, the golf cart jetpack. First of all, Golf cart jetpack, you guys. Uh, <laughs> this thing is huge. Uh, when you look at the video with Bubba Watson, wh which, first of all, he can't even ride in it. He couldn't ride in it. They would not allow him to ride it, of course, because he's an Olympic athlete, and God forbid that <laughs> golf cart jetpack crashes. He just shoots off into the sky and never seen again. Never see him again. It's a hole in one into yeah. another universe. Like, <laughs> hole in into a black, a black hole. hole. A black in hole one. in one. Oh, we did it. We did it. Just <laughs> shut it down, everybody. We're done. We're done here. 
Uh, Black Hole in One is my new band name and also <laughs> the greatest thing we've ever thought of on the show. Um, yeah, so golf cart jetpack, total publicity stunt, obviously, but the, a real working jetpack. This is yeah. a really big jetpack. You can do vertical takeoff and landing. It's a one-person jetpack, it, but it is gigantic. It looks like it is about the size of a golf cart. Yeah. Um, not nearly as quiet as a golf cart. Well, that's the thing. You know, when when this uh, this company first announced their jetpack technology in a big, you know, big fanfare, big internet rollout. Everyone was very excited. Excited. And then you see what it is, and it's it, it, this is not the jetpack future that I dreamed of, It's not right? the tiny jetpack we saw in, like, Tomorrowland, yeah. like this the movie Tomorrowland. This is not the Rocketeer. The yeah. beautiful rocketeer -esque. It's jet not pack. personal jetpack technology. This yeah, is like you put it in the garage. Put a car <laughs> on your back and fly yeah. yourself around. Yeah, but still very cool. But I mean, this this does beg the question for me: Where are we going to see personal transport going? Because yeah. one, we have autonomous cars, right? So we have uh, the advent of autonomous vehicles that are going to be sort of taxi services, where you'd summon it in an urban city and then mm -hmm. you take your cab wherever, and it drives you there and then it goes away. It goes back to some location without a driver. What about uh, like the e-hong? Mm -hmm. We saw that at uh, at CES. Right. It's sort of a very large individual drone. drone. Yeah. Um, and then that you get inside and it's ca it's covered. Right. And then you have things like this, like in 50 years, do you think people will be using those? Because I feel like they probably will. If they get a little smaller and they're you a think? little bit less expensive. I mean, no, I... No. If I lived less than 10 miles from work, I feel like I'd take a jetpack to work, right? Well, just like a motorcycle, just my, like a motorcycle. In my fantasy world, I would definitely take a jetpack. I just don't think it's this jetpack. No, 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 I'm uh, saying like in 50 years. Yeah. The evolution, let's say in 50 years. Do you think people will be riding jetpacks to work? I actually think that it's interesting that this is a golf cart jetpack because I think the, uh, the use case will be oddly analogous, right? A golf cart is something that isn't particularly useful in the world. It has a very specific, very specific use. narrow okay. use. Okay. And I think this kind of jetpack technology is also going to have a very specific narrow use if it ever becomes you mainstream think so? at all. Like I mean, but what, I, I don't want like, that to what be the about case. Just putting on a little backpack the size of a Jan Sport and just flying to work. Like that yeah. seems like that. That's like I feel the moment we can truly say like we are living the Jetsons, you guys. Like, oh, I because it's not a flying car. You're you're flying yourself. Like, Nobody you wants that flying. more than me. Nobody in the world wants that more than just, me. I like, just can't. Five hundred feet above the ground, jetpack it right into just, Burbank. Imagine you're sitting in your high rise. Uh, you know, here here in, in and your you, office. And you see building. the bat signal, no, and you're like, no, what, I hear the call, and you put on your jetpack and you fly away. What I'm imagining is sitting there in front of the window having lunch and it's just smack and it's a person like <laughs> you know <laughs> sliding well, down the window listen that set her horrible sound of that's sliding gonna down the happen window. for sure <laughs> because people are not great i think autonomy is probably maybe that's the there key you go. There. just strap yourself in and it's like you're just taking wherever the it jetpack takes, takes you. you it's just like flying you around i would love that <laughs> an autonomous jetpack. It's just a big hook that like hooks you to the back of your shirt and you're just like, whoa, here we go. Uh, yes. Yes. That that I need. Right. That I need. Sounds um to I totally love that and uh and it there's nothing that makes me happier than a, <laughs> than it than the idea of an autonomous All hook right. that will take me anywhere I want to go in town. Uh, black hole. In I one. gotta have a beautiful astronaut like clear helmet though, there so I go. can make sure my hair looks good yeah. when I when I land. Um <laughs> all right guys, that is it for our headlines. We're going to take a quick break. We are going to come back. Ted Shulowitz from Barco Escape is going to be this is in an the awesome studio. This discussion. Don't miss it. Uh, two days ago, uh, <laughs> he'll be in the studio. And then we're going to talk to him about this really cool experience where you sit in a movie theater, and if it's Barco Escape, you actually get to watch a three full three-screen movie experience uh, in, in Star Trek Beyond this weekend, which is pretty amazing. So stick around. It's Tomorrow Daily. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. We are very excited to welcome our next guest. This man is the chief creative officer at Barco Escape. He's also the resident futurist at 20th Century Fox. How do I apply for that job? Yeah. Uh, we're Get so excited resumes. to have Ted Shulow is here with us. Hey, we Ted. might have some openings. You never know. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm interested. Do you need please. an assistant futurist? We might have, a, we might have <laughs> a need for an assistant futurist. In fact, we have a whole team of people that are 
kind of on the on the curve with us that are figuring things out. Just so fun. this the futurists, we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about Barco because you have some really exciting stuff happening with Star Trek Beyond we this do. weekend. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the the title futurist because to me this seems like a really cool, sexy, mysterious job, and I want to know <laughs> what the day to day entails because to me the idea of being a futurist means you're sort of a think tank about the future, and you go listen, 20th Century Fox. I think the future is going to have way more robots than this, so you need to put more robots into this movie. Sort of. Um, <laughs> it's a little more pedestrian than that. I, I often refer to myself as, as a glorified lab rat. Oh. Um, I'm a guy who's constantly, and we have a bunch of labs. One of our labs is called The Bunker, the VR Bunker, where it's like this little oh, staircase. And I want to live in the can, VR Bunker. Can we, can we rent it? Yeah, <laughs> You can rent it and come over and visit. Great. We'll have you over and visit. That would be and awesome. And when you talk about it, it sounds like we built the Bat Cave. You know, it's like the most amazing place in the world. When you go to it, there's a bunch of technology inside a room, a bunch of VR and AR stuff, a bunch of monitors, a bunch of future thinking stuff. But it's just a dark room. Uh, we're really comfortable with that. But then we've, we're sort of spread out all over the lot. We have a big theater on the lot where we experiment with stuff, with the Barco Escape stuff. We have uh, an, an area in the, the tower, you know, the, the, the Nakatomi Tower. Sure. That is yeah. called the Fox Innovation Lab. Um, where and I that's where you whole... clone Bruce Willis over and over again <laughs> to repeat. <laughs> Among other on. interesting Perfect. things. Perfect. So Great. you are not, it's not that you are advising filmmakers uh, about what the future is going to be to put in their movies. It's that you are developing technologies to expand and improve the ways we appreciate Yeah, they, they all kind of dovetail together, but, but it's more the second one. It's okay. more looking at what is around the next corner, like what's around the bend here that may become important, relevant, and extraordinarily valuable for the entertainment industry. Sure. And what we've done over the past few years since I've kind of taken on this very odd and interesting job is really driven Fox into the forefront of the conversation of being the studio that is the most forward thinking, the most what I call lean forward as opposed to lean backward, uh, not afraid of taking risks, not afraid of figuring things out, not afraid of seeing what are the things that people are working on in the dark corners mm -hmm. that are going to become things. And interestingly enough, the timing of me joining Fox when I left this movie camera company, Red, when I retired from that, and my uh, one of my friends at 20th Century Fox is the president of post-production there, who's part of this little posse of pioneers, uh, his name is Ted Galliano, said, come and be the futurist at the movie studio. And just, you know, you kind of have your eyes and ears on a lot of things, and you've always been sort of on the forefront of this stuff, sure. helping build stuff and start companies and figure things out. Would you be willing to do that uh, for the movie studio and essentially help guide us a little mm. bit into what might what's be next? relevant? Right, what's next? And the timing was really interesting because a lot of this VR stuff started to happen right around that time. So I was very early on with the Oculus guys, very early on with the Valve team and the HTC team and the Sony team and the Samsung team and uh, Microsoft and HoloLens and this small group called ODG that's doing next-gen AR stuff that we're working on. And that, those are just the highlights, and there's tons right. more out there that we're so exciting. But all day long, I just experiment and have these various things on my face, or in an immersive cinema experience with Barco. The first two movies we did with Barco Escape were two Fox movies. The first two Maze Runner movies mm -hmm. that were really successful, and now, of course, we're on the cusp of Star Trek Beyond and Escape. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Barco Escape because I think a lot of people probably don't know that a it exists because there's so few theaters mm -hmm. that can play uh, Barco Escape content. And then on top of that, um, you know, what what you guys have planned for, it's a little bit like IMAX, where it's sort of a cinematic experience you're, you're just never going to get at home. Right. And so it's one of those things that you have to see to sort of appreciate. Um, but for those people out there who are not familiar with Barco Escape, explain a little bit about what that is and, and why it's so intense as a film, as a moviegoer yeah. to, to see it. So you're right. So the, the footprint is relatively small. It's a, it's a new format. So those, you know, a generation from now will be telling our kids and our grandkids, remember when there were just like 30 or 40 theaters around the world that you could see this in before it became the thing, right? right. And so that's where we are now, which is kind of a romantic time to be involved in something new and exciting. Um, but in terms of what it is, what, what, what you will see when you go to a movie theater. So it's a three-screen experience instead of a one-screen experience. Okay. You're, of course, familiar with going to the movies. And the movies sure. essentially from when movies have been created up until now, uh, 100 years, have basically been something like this, some geometric form, whether it was a square a or a rectangle. A box in front of my face. 
or That's a really big box in front of your face, sure. <laughs> which are very exotic and great. And you know, IMAX is a, where Barco does all the underlying technology for bar, for IMAX projection, and so we're a big fan of that and we collaborate with them a lot. This is something even more different and more special than that for an out of the home experience. So instead of the movie just being in front of you, it actually surrounds your periphery, and we bring you into certain scenes of the movie when it's appropriate to really take advantage of this. Let's go all the way and not just be watching a screen, but actually kind of inside the experience. So the films actually have to be shot with this in mind, right? Not necessarily. In the case of uh, Star Trek, it's actually because it's such a CGI VFX heavy movie, all of the uh, most, there's some augmented stuff with cameras, but most of the material is actually created in post-production in VFX oh, interesting. with all of the space battle scenes and all the epic uh, action scenes and all the stuff that you know. So all the things you expect when you've seen a regular screening of the movie, right. imagine all those key moments when it's not just this, it's this. Is this something you. that later on can be then applied into a VR environment yes. so that you can then be looking around you later yes. on at home? Yes. In fact, uh, it's very often referred to, Barco Escape is very often referred to in the trade, now that we have a trade for this stuff, as bricks and mortar VR. We know oh, that people like to socialize. We know that people like this. They like real connection and they like to sit with their popcorn and their candy and enjoy the experience. And VR is, you know, somewhat isolating experience, although we're working on social in Expanding VR as that, well. Right, so of yeah. course. that's a bit of a I'm telling you one story, but there's actually another story <laughs> there too where VR will become a very social thing, For which sure. is part of why Facebook would be interested in right. having VR around as a as a technology. Sure. But within a theater environment, this is sort of the most immersive, most VR-like experience. And we know that with modern audiences, once you get a taste for something that what we call breaks out of the rectangle, mm -hmm. whether that's in something you're going to put on your face or some sort of glassware or some sort of theme park style experience, you want more of that. You say, I want something that separates from the home experience. Mm -hmm. I can get really good big screen at home. Yeah. I want something different. I want literally something that's more like I went to a theme park, but I could go every Friday night, every Saturday afternoon, every Sunday morning with my family. Don't have to spend hundreds of, or thousands of dollars to get on a plane and go to Orlando or, you know, or Los Angeles from far away but go to my local multiplex and have this kind of immersive theme park style experience in a movie. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I think that's one of the things the movie industry has struggled with, I think a little bit historically, as televisions have gotten bigger and cheaper and higher def and we have seen more and more streaming content come into homes. People go, well, why should I go to the movies? Why it's, I can get that on my 70 inch TV that I bought at Best Buy last week for two grand, you know? Um, and I, I think it's really interesting that you're, you guys are always looking for the, the what's next of bringing people into the theater, not only as a, uh, like you said, a social experience, because that's always when I like to go see movies, where you go in on opening weekend and people are cheering and they're, I mean, they're just having a great time. People who are really into that movie are there to yeah, see it's it. It's the buzz, right? Yeah. It's the buzz. You get to experience that, the highs and lows of, you know, with everybody else, a very collective social experience. Really interesting. Um, but you're also kind of now having to not only give moviegoers that experience, but also the visual experience to go with it. And that make people say, hey, I want to come back to this or I, I want to do this more often mm -hmm. because it's not something I can get at my house. I know that, you know, going to see a Chris Nolan movie in IMAX, there are those moments where it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It expands you fall up. into the screen. Is that kind of the same experience here is that there are certain scenes where it'll just envelop you? Yes, similar but way more intense than just going from here to here because yeah. here we're just expanding the square, expanding the rectangle, which by the way, I love, and it's part of the inspiration. Sure. There's nothing wrong about all these other experiences. Just instead right? of expanding vertically, you're we going go this way. Whoosh, way this all way. around you, right. That's right. so, so it's essentially a 180 view all around. There you. was a moment uh, at Comic-Con a few years ago where that was done in mm -hmm. Hall H. Yes. Is that this, is similar? Similar, and they're, and they're doing that again. You're going to see some stuff around movies because in areas other than a movie theater, other than a multiplex, where you can expand that vision and you have the budget to expand that vision, like a theme park, like a big convention, like Comic-Con, um, this happens. Big trade shows do this all the time. Like if you go to the E3 gaming show, mm -hmm. you'll see they'll set up that big 360. They'll set up right. a whole bunch of barcode projectors and they'll do right. this kind of thing. Sure. Our mission was to take that to everybody. So not just people that work in the industry or if you're lucky enough to go to Comic Con and be in Hall H and wait eight hours right. to do that experience, right? Which yeah, if you're is lucky, eight hours. Unbelievable. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky to be working in the industry and I can 
go and do that stuff. And right. I'm just, I'm so impressed with those people that are so committed to that entertainment. Those are our core customers that want to see Barco Escape. Sure. They don't want a normal experience. Right. They want a special experience, right? They want it the, so, to see it the best possible way yeah. in, in the most fun environment. Yeah. Um, and, and what we're doing is is expanding that footprint to every city around the world is yeah. the plan. So we'll have, we have a little over 30 theaters now for Barco Escape okay. worldwide. So um, essentially what I like to say is if you're a fan, super fan, you can get likely anywhere in the United States now, you can get on a on less than an hour flight and find a Barco Escape or likely drive less than an hour to a couple of hours, which people will easily do. If you live in any major population area, give or take, you're going to find one within easy striking distance. We have two in LA, we have a couple up in the Bay Area, Northern California, we have one in Palm Springs area, we have oh. a bunch in Texas. We have uh, one in Minnesota. We have, you know, the, and, and all over the U.S. If you go to a website called Ready to Escape, so Ready the Number Two Escape, okay. or just Google Barco Escape, it'll give you. You'll some. see a listing, and then you can click and go to your local theater and buy tickets, and it'll tell you which one because you know it'll be the regular version, the IMAX version, the, the big screen digital version, and then the Barco Escape version. Is the end goal to have the entire film shot like this? It's one of the goals. So yeah. we're. Um, or do you think it works better as shorter moments? I, I think it's project to project. Mm -hmm. um, just like any other sort of creative entity, there's no one right way to skin the cat. There's no one right approach to it. So sure. with Star Trek, it's a little over 20 minutes, those key battle action scenes, which totally lend themselves. And trying not to give anything away, but you know the big climax scene in the movie? I do. With what happens there. Yes. So imagine that visual Inside experience. It, yeah. It's just yeah, like it's cool. we were we were doing our final QC, what's called QC quality control screenings last night at three in the morning, because these things are coming in hot. <laughs> right. <laughs> like finishing up the last yeah. day with the team from Bad Robot and it's yeah. just insane, right? When that music and, kicks in, I imagine if it's all around you, it's but, gotta you know, be. At three forty five AM last night I'm sitting there going, This is the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, there's only five yeah. of us. You're in like, the I'm theater, up at three forty five. A bunch in the of morning. technicians and the producer. This yeah. is worth yeah. it. It was That's awesome. If you could retcon on any movie into Barco Escape, what would you do? Whew. Well, we're working with Jerry Bruckheimer. Um, okay. And we've talked about redoing Top Gun and Escape, which oh would be interesting. Oh my God, interesting. that would be awesome. Um, we've, we've been talking to Michael Bay. We've been talking to a lot of really big A-level filmmakers. We've had them all into the theater. They've all seen stuff. All the major studios are interested. Um, you know, because they're exploring. Well, it's so right? immersive, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, yeah, as you said, I mean, everyone's looking for that next thing, and it's really interesting to see sort of Barco taking the lead in terms of saying, hey guys, like, we've, we have got this locked down, we're experimenting on everything, and we feel this is the way forward. Mm -hmm. This is the really cool thing that people want. Yeah. Is, and, and, I'm sorry. I said, we would tell you that we're not the ones that know all the answers to any of this, right? It's a creative process. We take in lockstep and hopefully fall one half a step behind the creators behind the people in, at, at Bad Robot in this case, and behind the people at Fox in the, in the other cases, where we want to make sure that the technology drives the story, not the other way around, right? Mm, it's, yeah. or, or, sorry, the story drives the technology, not the technology driving the story. Sure. Um, and that's really, really important. And when you see Star Trek, you'll see how that works. Um, the other thing that's really critical, I think, is that we're taking this and putting it in normal movie theaters all around the world. So there'll be 100 by year's end, and then we move to thousands in a couple of years. And it's just one of those formats that you're like, this is the movie we're going to go see. Right. We're working, as you were asking about production and stuff, we're working on two new movies now, one that's shooting in South Africa called 24 Hours to Live, mm -hmm. um, with Ethan Hawke in it, and his big movie, they're shooting big action scenes, and a movie up in Canada called Recall. Uh, there's a bunch of cinemas in Canada with uh, Cineplex theaters and Imagine theaters. So Canada's also got their right, all those Star Trek different fans sort of experience. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so we're all over. The footprint's quite large. I can't wait to see it in person myself. I, I, yeah. It sounds really, really cool, and it's. Uh, I it's get to go see it this weekend. So yeah, you're going to see it in Barco. Yeah, I'm going to go see it in Barco Escape. Awesome. I'm very excited. I can't wait to see it. Well, you have to um, let me know. Yeah, yeah. Ted Chilowitz, everybody, uh, thank you so much yeah, for sure. being My here. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, where can, uh, you already said, um, it's what's the website again for, uh, for the escape? Ready to escape. Ready to escape two, with the number two. Or just Google Barco Escape, you'll find it. Uh, and li likely you're within striking distance of getting to one of these theaters now. Great. And before the next couple years are out, there'll be one in every neighborhood. There'll be more. There'll be more, you guys. Uh, so that is it for our interview. Thank you so much for stopping by. And uh, we'll send you our resumes for those assistant yes, futurist please. jobs. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll be right back, guys, with more tomorrow daily. So stick around. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, Ted is a great guy. Yeah, and I'm very excited to hear your experience when you get to go see Star Trek Beyond I'm in very, that, with that technology. It's cool. I'm more than excited yeah. to see that 
I've never experienced a movie like that, so I'm really looking forward to it. And have to I report back. And I know we were talking about the Dark Knight and IMAX going vertically and stuff. I'm really, I really loved that, so I'm wondering how much more I'm going to really like this. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, okay, so it is time to talk about a crowd fund, which means, as always, it is time for Back It or Hack It. <laughs> Jeff, in your wildest VR dreams, which yes, you are somewhat have, of a VR expert, you're a guru at this point. I'm definitely an evangelist, if nothing else. Yeah, I would yeah. call you a VR guru. Uh, all right, I'll I'd take call it. you a guru. Um, you would you want an experience where you could, for an hour, go to outer space? Yes. Walk amongst the stars. Yes. And listen to an orchestra. Oh, that last bit. Was not, I'm not anticipating. Maybe out of left field a yeah. little bit, like a left turn. But I like uh, walking in the stars and having some sweet tunes. All right. Hook me up. Hook me up. This name is so close to your name that I thought it was appropriate. This is Hubble Cantata. Oh. Hubble Cantata. And you could say, you kind of think about, okay, well, like, I kind of get the idea of where that's going if you're into music and you're familiar with yes. like, contos and things mm -hmm. like that. So this is a live virtual reality performance oh. uh, that incorporates many of Hubble Telescope's beautiful photos that we see, the high, high resolution photos we see on NASA's website, mm -hmm. which are all uh, free to use. Oh, neat. So they've taken these photos and they have, uh, they have created a 3D universe in which you can uh, wander about, wow. which is pretty neat. It, it, you know, it reminds reality. me almost like, a, sounds almost like a virtual reality Fantasia. Almost. Yes, it kind of reminds me of that too. And when you watch, when you see the video, like we'll we'll show you guys the B roll. It's uh, you can sort of see the sort of dimensions and the layers that they've they put a lot of work into this. They put a lot of work into this. Yeah. Um. So here's what they want to do. This is they're calling it quote the first multi dimensional view into space paired with a live performance. Hmm. So there you go. Well, I don't understand the idea of live performance. Like it's it's. When it you, will be live. They're going to do so it you, live. It's like tune in on Tuesday at 7. On and August 6th. Huh. On August 6th. So it's wow. coming up very quickly. As part of the Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival at Prospect Park Bandshell, they are going to premiere Hubble Cantata for about 6,000 people. The, it'll be the first free live event to fuse a major musical performance. This is from their Kickstarter. 20-piece ensemble a 100-person choir, hmm. and two Met, Met opera stars. They're going to wow. have opera singers there with a virtual reality experience um, with a 360-degree sound installation. Wow. So you're going to be able to really... You are literally going to be immersed in this. So this is not something I do up from my home? Well, so they're going to do this live. Right. So that 6,000 people are going to have this, this personal encounter like at the wow. thing. And then they want to release it, I oh, believe. That's cool. Like they want to release it later. So they were saying, like, they did, uh, you know, they're like, you should totally check this out. And we plan to release, uh, after the premiere, we're going to release it in an app. Hmm. It's going to be called uh, Fistful of Stars. It, you can experience the cosmos. They're, they're, like, very big fans of the Hubble Telescope. I love this. It's really cool. Like, I love how they're doing this. This is awesome. It seems like a, an odd thing to kickstart. It's sort of like you have to kickstarter it for other people to experience it. For the live it. event, but then also they're going to build that app. So yeah. it's like you're sort of investing in the app. And it's really cool because at that event, they're going to pass out Google Cardboard for everybody. Oh, and then you're just going to be able to drop your phone in and use it right away. So huh. that everybody will be able to hold up their cardboard. You know, there's it. already been a bunch of live VR events. Reggie Watts uh, hosted something. He had stand-up comedy. He did a whole stand-up set. Exactly. And so th this idea of tuning in to something live in VR that only exists in a VR environment, I think is really catching on. And yeah. it's, it's becoming something. I think so. And this is a really interesting sort of facet of virtual reality and, and even I would say to some extent augmented reality to know that you know at some point there are going to be experiences you could only get one time yeah and it I think it increases the value of those events and also the interest in those events because when you know that it's not on demand yeah you, you're either going to make time for it or you won't I tell you, you know, I, the number of times I've been inside a virtual environment and just uh, in awe of what I'm seeing, to do that on a galactic scale with real footage from the Hubble t Telescope with this beautiful sort of uplifting, emotional, powerful Orchestral music. Orchestral experience. Yeah, I mean, because if you listen to opera singers <sighs> at their best, it, it really is... It, it, there's it's nothing like it. It moves you. Yeah, you know? truly moves that's you. Really it's really cool. amazing. It's a neat idea. So they want 35 grand, which is not a terribly insane goal. Like no. one of the lower back at our hackets we've seen. Yeah, I think it's a it's a tricky thing for people. You sort of have to donate it 
to see it happen. You want you want right. the idea of this happening rather than getting something out of it. Yeah, and so uh, they want thirty five thousand. They have about ten percent of that right now. So yeah. they got twenty two days left though. Um, and I then this is neat. they're saying basically like if you donate twenty five bucks, you get to download uh, the the digital download of the music, and oh. uh, you get wallpaper downloads of the Hubble imagery, and then. Um, so they'll give you like credit. There's like a whole bunch of stuff that you can donate to like hmm. make this happen. So pretty neat. Yeah, it's pretty. I cool. hope it happens. I would I love do to too. to see this happen and eventually see an app if if they make that. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty good stuff. Um, so that is it for back it or hack it. Uh, so now we get to talk about what we are into, and this is appropriately called into it. <laughs> Okay, so I feel like I should go first because it's yeah. happening. It's literally happening right now. What are you into? Uh, Comic Con, guys. It's yeah. all about Comic Con. Comic Con is Comic Con is Comic Con is Comic Con. Guess what? I'm not going. Yeah, me neither. I'm super into I, it, but I'm I've not going. I've gone for many years in a row, and uh, I'm not going this year. I know, me too. Yeah. And I, it's weird, but I, I am excited though because Comic Con HQ is doing live streams from all the big panels, so yeah. I feel like I'll be able to kind of be there, which is good. Yeah. Um, but there's going to be so many good panels this year. So you got you got Suicide Squad coming mm -hmm. this year. Uh, Marvel is coming with Doctor Strange Whoa. and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Yes, indeed. Uh, we're going to see, obviously, game, on the TV side, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead. I mean, those are going to be really huge, great mm -hmm. panels. Uh, and then also, uh, there's all kinds of installations and, and things going on. Like our friends at Screen Junkies are doing a whole thing. They have a whole setup. They're going to be doing interviews and all this stuff. Um, I, I, I do want to discuss, like, Comic-Con as a as an event. Yeah. I'm really into Comic-Con, but I find myself wanting to go there less and less every year because it has become such a behemoth. Yeah. Do you think it needs to be split into different things? Well, you know, they talked a, for a long time about moving it up to Los Angeles just because there's more room. It's more space. Yeah. And more hotel. Like, there's more hotels. It's just... If you have never gone through buying a Comic-Con ticket, it is... It's a nightmare it's wrapped kind in of the worst. hellscape. Yeah. But... There's something about San Diego that is infused the gas with comic. lamp. Yeah, it's, it's a it's, it's it is Comic Con. Right. So I would be sort of against that idea. Yeah. But by the same token, I definitely relate to what you're saying. And and as somebody who went as a little kid and has gone for many many years and watched it turn into this massive, overwhelming, it's so huge. You, you, there was a time when you could sort of get there and look at the schedule and go, oh, I kind of want to see that and that and that and that. And you'll hit now, all those things. Yeah, now you can pick one and stand in line all day for that one you thing. You pick one Hall H panel, that's all you get. And it's like, well, you either pick that. You can If you get into Hall H, and that's a big you if. You can stay in Hall H. You can stay the whole day. Go and that's early. That's what we used to do. Stay early. But most of the time, it, you're, you know, there's things, and you don't want to spend all day inside one place, or right. even if you do want to spend all day in one place, the, you have to get up and stand in line at like 2 o'clock in the morning. It's or really rough. It's the insanity of the number of people that are there and what's going on. Now, that being said, it's a lot of fun it's to just so wander fun. around and see all the cosplay I and know. walk That's the like show floor. That's like my favorite part is the cosplay, and I get to see a lot of my friends that don't live in yeah. L.A., um, you know, like there's some of the cast of Archer and like stuff like that. Like those are people I love seeing, but yeah. it's like I just uh, I can't bring myself to go down there and like and just it's so many people and so much and so overwhelming because before okay so um, before Comic Con used to be just the convention center, yeah, and then it started like like a terrible blob. It started <laughs> creeping into yeah. the gas lamp district, and now it takes up. Like four blocks of a gas lamp yeah, and, and like the, six blocks wide. The, sta the Petco, stadium, the Padres play. Yeah, plus Petco. the stadium, Petco Park. It's like it's, there's stuff happening in there. I mean, you the you problem, would need a four day pass just to see half of the stuff. The problem, in my my view, with all of this is that it, it just makes it really hard to take kids. Yeah. And I grew up going to comic book conventions. And you're and, about to be pushing a stroller. It's true. And I couldn't imagine taking a young kid to Comic Con. It's it is Very so overwhelming. It, it really is a, built for adults, and and I think that's a shame because these properties should be open and accessible to kids. Yeah. There are people to take kids. I just can't imagine doing it. It just seems Exhausting so overwhelming for, for a kid and mm -hmm. kind of dangerous and a little scary. And yeah. it just there's such a throng of people all pushing and shoving. It's that's true. It's true. But uh, I mean, intense. I'm still excited about it. I still am dying to see what everybody brings because obviously it's like it's like. Nerd Christmas. Like, everybody gets so excited about it. Yeah. So, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sad I won't be Christmas. there. 
Um, but I'm going to be watching on Comic Con HQ all day. I'm not watching it right now. I should be. I want to watch <laughs> it right now. What are you into? Uh, you called me the VR guru, so you I are. feel like I gotta gotta step up. Uh, and a huge, huge week for VR this last week. Uh, a massive release. Uh, a game called Raw Data was mm. put out on the Vive. Uh, and it is only in early access. It's not complete yet. It has a lot of functionality turned off. But it is already, I think, a killer app for oh, Vive. Oh, you think it's a seller? Absolutely. And when, right. it, when it has all the stuff kind of going on in it, I think people are going to... It, it already was the first VR game to crack the Steam top 10. Oh. So, it, you know, it is, people are digging it already. It's $30, I think, right now. For early access, what's the replay value on this? Or how, well, like, what do you, how do you play? You, you, it's 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 a wave shooter, so you're in okay. different environments, and waves of of robots are coming at you. There's drone robots that fly. There's little crawly oh, robots. Gotta get there's those robots. automatons that you have to shoot. You shoot. Well, there's two classes right now. And they're going to have more. Oh. One is a pistol guy that you can level up and get interesting, cool n new perks, and the other is the cyber ninja, which is basically a Jedi. It's Genji. Genji you get from Overwatch. you get a sword that can reflect laser beams back this at the This is literally attackers. Genji from Overwatch. Yeah, you can throw it and it comes back to your hand. Oh, you can't throw the sword, you but can, he has some, And you he have a stars. jumping attack, uh, which they've managed to figure out a way to do that and not make you nauseated. It's amazing. Sweet. Uh, but the best part of this game, best part of this game, is that it now supports uh, over the internet multiplayer. So me oh, and my Vive boy. and my friend and his Vive, both in our uh, unique homes, Exist in the same virtual space, can do virtual high fives, which we were a lot. Totally. And of are course. taking on these waves of robots at the same time, talking to each other, playing different classes, going, okay, Oh my god, here they come, they're coming really on the side, fun. attacking you. Ah, it is a blast. And it totally, I think, it looks great. It looks like a real high quality, you know, worth AAA game. You're selling me on all your enthusiasm here. Like, it, I really feel strongly. This is something you could put somebody in right away that is already a hardcore gamer, and they, and they go, Oh, I see why VR is special. It's called Raw Data. Raw data. It's from uh, Servios. It's on Steam right now, early access. I it, it is a reason to own a Vive, in my opinion. All right. I like that. Yeah. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, so fun. You want to check out our photographer of the day? Let's do it. Okay. Our photographer of the day today is Antonio, who yes. sent in this picture that he took with his iPhone 6 Plus, and he wrote in a very nice email and said, first of all, my name is Antonio. I'm 13. I'm from Portugal. I have been watching Tomorrow Daily since its first few episodes, and I really like the show. I've also been listening to Jeff and Anthony Carboni's We Have Concerns podcast, which I like Yay. a lot. You're all doing great work. I like this Antonio fella. Me too. Let's get to the main subject, my picture. The photo I'm attaching with this email is of my pet Corona Gloucester canary bird, wow. Teco, inspired by the Portuguese name for Dale from Disney's Chip and Dale. As with all Corona Gloucester canary birds, he has a crest. In the photo, he had dipped his head too deep into his water container, getting his crest wet and ending up with a punk rock haircut. Once I heard July's theme was pets, I immediately thought that my bird's punk haircut would be a nice candidate. The photo was taken with an iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, remember when Ashley got one too on launch, same color and capacity as mine. Do you still have it? And you have full permission to use it on the show. Be good humans, Antonio. Uh, I don't have my 6 Plus because I upgraded to a 6S. But it's the exact same phone. It's just a 6S. <laughs> so it's space gray, 64 gigs. I on. love that picture. Punk rock bird. Uh, I would never have known the name of the bird, but that's cool. Teco. I love it. I mean, the, you know, the Oh, yeah, the type, name, the yeah. type of bird. Yeah. I'm not a bird watcher, so Me no. Um, but, but it's awesome. really awesome what looking bird. What an awesome bird. picture. Thanks for sending that in. Everybody loves a punk rock bird. <laughs> punk rock bird. Um, if you want to send your picture to our show and be our next photographer, send it to tomorrow at CNET.com. Yes, our theme this month is pets. You have one week left to send in your great pet pictures, and then we'll have another theme that we will probably announce next week, maybe. I don't know. There's a very special theme next month, so maybe we will, maybe we Get won't. Get excited. I don't know. Just think about it. Uh, you got to do four things, though, when you send in your picture. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, you need to tell us how to pronounce your name if yep. there is any chance we could mispronounce it. Which is a good chance. There's a good chance. Uh, give us permission to use it on the show because legal would like that. Yes. Tell us a story about your picture. Oh, we love stories. And in that story, tell us what device you took your picture on. Indeed. Um, all those things, and you got a great chance of landing on the show. So, Like uh, Antonio. Thanks, Antonio. And thanks for the shout out. And thanks, Teco. Yeah. I, I would say something to you in bird, but I can like barely whistle. It's like, yeah, there you go. That's a, sh Oh my God, that's so offensive. <laughs> Don't say that out loud. Uh, I'm sorry. That is it for the show this week. We will be back on Monday with a brand new, or I will be back on Monday with a brand new docket. Jeff will be, be out of town for a few days. 
Uh, we'll be back on Monday with a brand new docket of science fact meeting science fiction, and then we're going to talk about it. So until next time. Be good humans. Bye, guys.